Okay, now let's put things together and go through the full variational autoencoder. So the variational autoencoder is a latent variable model that has latent variables z that have a Gaussian prior, and it has observed variables x, which might be an image. It has an encoder, which performs inference, and that's q phi of z given x. q phi of z given x is a neural network that takes in x, and it produces a mean and a variance over z. The decoder, p theta of x given z, takes in a z, and it produces a mean and a variance over x. For this basically means a mean and a variance over every pixel in the image, independently. So you could think of this as having a normally distributed spherical latent variable. You sample from that latent variable, and then you generate p theta of x given z. And you can use variational autoencoders after they're trained to actually generate new pictures, in contrast to things like denoising autoencoders or bottleneck autoencoders, which can learn representations but cannot generate. So here you're seeing pictures of faces that were actually generated by a variational autoencoder. It was trained uh, by using the, the architecture that I, that I showed in the previous uh, section. And then after being trained, you just sample z from the uh, prior, from, the, uh, from p of z, and then use the decoder to generate images. The encoder is not used in this part. So here's the architecture that I walked you through in the previous part. And here's the objective. So you'll notice that the first part of the objective basically looks like an autoencoder objective. Log p theta xi given mu phi xi plus epsilon sigma phi xi. You encode xi into mu and sigma, get z by doing mu plus epsilon times sigma, and then you decode to get the resulting distribution over x, and you try to maximize the probability of the real image, the one that you encoded, under this distribution. So this is the first part is an autoencoder objective. And the second part can be thought of as a kind of penalty that penalizes how much q phi of z given xi deviates from the prior p of z. And from this, uh, we can derive a little bit of intuition uh, as to why the variational autoencoder works. So all this math about variational inference gives us the mathematical foundations. But the intuition is that because that second KL divergence term encourages the encoded z's to look similar to samples from p of z by making the distribution similar, that creates a situation where at test time, if you just sample from p of z, the decoder will know what to do with those z's. They will look familiar to the decoder and will be able to turn them into realistic images. Because during training, the encoder was encouraged to produce the z's that look similar to the prior, and therefore the decoder was trained to produce reasonable images using those z's. Okay, so how can we use the, the variational autoencoder? Um, well, the variational autoencoder approximates this latent variable distribution. So if we want to sample from it, we just sample z from p of z from the prior, and then sample our image from p of x given z. Why does it work? Uh, well, it works because, um, as I said before, the KL divergence term, that second term in the objective, encourages the encoder to produce z's that look similar to the z's that we would get from the prior p of z. Now, we can also train conditional models with variational autoencoders. That's actually fairly straightforward to do. If you have a conditional model, uh, then you are mapping x to some output variable y, and you would like p of y given x to be some fairly complex distribution. We use the same intuition as before. P of y given x might be complex, but P of y given x comma z will be simple. So now our decoder gives us y uh, given x comma z, and our encoder gives us z given x comma y. So everything is just like before, only now we're generating x, and everything is conditioned, uh, now we're generating y, and everything is conditioned on x. That's, that's the only change we have to make. And you can do this, for example, if you want a multimodal uh, policy and imitation learning, or if you want a VAE that can uh, generate images conditioned on some other piece of information, for example, generating images for objects of a particular category. Okay, so the architecture is very simple. Like before, you have your encoder that takes in x and y, and that produces mu and sigma. Just like before, you sample your noise, and you do mu plus epsilon times sigma to get your z, and then you have a decoder, and the decoder now also takes in the x and the z and produces y. So everything is conditioned on x, 
and then y is what's being autoencoded. And that gives you a conditional VA. And then at test time, you sample z from p of z given xi, and you sample y from p of y given xi comma z. Uh, and you have a choice. You can either learn the prior p of z given xi, so that can be another neural network, or you can have a fixed prior. So z can be uh, distributed according to just an unconditional distribution p of z, or according to p of z given xi, and that's a design choice that you can make. So that's a conditional auto, a variational autoencoder. Um, now let's talk a little bit more about neural net architectures for variational autoencoders and specifically how we can design variational autoencoders with convolutions. So let me walk you through a, a potential architecture we might use for a VAE with convolutions. So you have your image, and first your image has to go into the encoder, to Q5. So let's say that your image is 64 by 64 by 3, three color channels. And maybe your first layer has 5x5 five five conv and 32 channels. And it has a stride of 2 because we need to reduce the resolution a bit. So that means that your first convolutional map will be 30x30x32. 30 by 30 by then you have a 3x3x64 three by three by conv. You get a 14x14x64 14 14 response map. Then you have a 3x3x128 three three conv. You get a 6x6x128 response map. Then you flatten it and pass it through a fully connected layer. And let's say that you get um, a fully connected layer with 1,024 units. This is not by any means the only architecture you use, it's just a sample architecture, um, just to walk you through an example. So far everything is the same as any other convolutional autoencoder, but now we're going to have one fully connected layer that outputs mu, and another fully connected layer that outputs sigma. And let's say that the dimensionality of both of those is 256. Okay? So we chose 256 as the number of dimensions for the hidden code. Then we're going to sample are normally distributed epsilons, so they, so it's a vector where every entry is just sampled from a normal distribution with mean zero and variance one. What is the length of this vector? Take a moment to think about that and guess what the length of the vector is. Well, the, the length of the vector needs to match the dimensionality of z, so it's going to be 256. And then we multiply epsilon by sigma, and we add mu, and that gives us z. What's the dimensionality of z? Well, it's the same as mu sigma and epsilon. It's going to be 256. And this is our bottleneck representation. If we want to, do, if we want to use a variational autoencoder for representation learning, for example, for a downstream classification task, this is the vector that we would use as our compressed representation of the image. So if we want to train some classifier uh, on top of this, we would train on top of z. But for training the VAE, now we also need the decoder. And for the decoder, we're going to use transpose convolutions. So maybe first we have a fully connected layer that takes the z up to a higher dimensionality, like 1024, and then we might have three layers of transpose convolutions to uh, upsample it all the way back up to a 64 by 64 image. And then we train this whole thing end to end with backpropagation by using two loss terms, uh, the negative log probability of the image and the KL divergence between the distribution determined by mu z and sigma z and our prior P of Z, which is typically a zero mean unit variance Gaussian. And remember also that our decoder actually outputs uh, two numbers potentially for each pixel, either a mean and a variance, so two numbers, or the decoder might output only a mean value for each pixel, and the variance might be fixed to some uh, fixed number, like one, for example. We could also have a discrete decoder. We could also output, let's say, a 256-way softmax for every pixel, or something more complex, like a discretized logistic as we described in the lecture on Monday. Now here's a question for you to ponder. Can we design a fully convolutional VAE? Right. This architecture resembles a little bit some of those fully convolutional networks that we saw in the beginning of the course when we talked about semantic segmentation. Could we design a fully convolutional variational autoencoder? Well, the answer is we actually can. Uh, mechanically, it would be pretty straightforward. We would just have a convolutional response map for mu and sigma, and we would sample a convolutional response map for epsilon, and all the operations would be exactly the same. But you have to be a little bit careful when you do this, because your prior P of z has an identity covariance, which means that you're assuming that your latent codes are independent along all their dimensions. So while it's quite straightforward to implement a fully convolutional VAE, it's often not such a good idea 
because uh, the values in the uh, convolutional response map are very unlikely to be independent of one another. And your prior is independent. So you might have a very hard time minimizing that KL divergence. It's quite possible to use a fully convolutional VE, and people have done it. But just keep in mind that it has a few uh, conceptual issues. All right. Now, a few comments about VAEs in practice. And these are some common pitfalls that you might see when you try to actually use variational autoencoders. One common issue is that it is very tempting for VAEs, especially conditional VAEs, to ignore the latent code or to generate poor samples. Um, why is that the case, especially for conditional VAE? Why might it be tempting to ignore the latent code? Why might it be tempting to ignore Z? Well, the reason is that if you can actually approximate your x with just a, a regular Gaussian distribution, it's much easier, especially for conditional VAEs, to do this because initially the z just looks like noise. So figuring out how to use z can be pretty hard, especially when part of your objective is to make the z's look more like the prior distribution. So it's very tempting to just pull, push the z distribution all the way to the prior, making it completely uninformative and therefore useless. So there are kind of two problems that VAEs can have while they're training. Problem one is that the latent code is ignored. What that means is um, your p of x given z just starts looking like p of x. Basically, it ignores the z. How can you tell this is happening? Well, you can tell this is happening when you encode a particular image, and you decode it, and you get back something that doesn't look like the image that you encoded. Basically, Encoding something and then decoding it back again produces kind of a blurry average image when reconstructing. So this has nothing to do with sampling. It is just you see this when you're reconstructing an image. You encode x through q phi and then you decode back through p theta and you get back an image that doesn't look like the thing you put in. It looks instead it looks kind of like a blurry average image, like an average of all the images in your data set. So when you take z distributed according to q phi of z given x and you take x according to p theta x given z, you get back a blurry average image. And that means that your latent code is likely getting ignored. A second problem you might get, which is a very different problem, is that the latent code is not compressed. It's in some ways the opposite problem. In this case, q phi of z given x is very far from p of z. If that's the problem you have, your reconstructions will look great. This is basically the problem where the variational autoencoder is too much like an identity function. So what does that look like? Your reconstructions will be great, but when you sample, when you actually sample a z from p of z and then decode, you'll get garbage. You'll get a, a really ugly looking, unrealistic image. So, you, so if you have problem two, that means that your reconstructions look very good. But when, you, when you take a z according to p of z instead of q5 of z given x, and then decode, you get nonsense. And these two problems can be characterized by different values of this scale divergence. That's that, that second term, the scale divergence penalty in your VAE objective. So I'm going to tell you right now, for one of these problems, the scale divergence is too low, for the other one is too high. Can you guess which is which? So for problem one, is it too low or too high? For problem two, is it too low and too high or too high? Take a moment to think about this. You could pause, pause the video, um, think about it some more, and then when you're ready to see the answer, you can resume watching the lecture. So the answer is that for problem one, it's typically characterized by the KL divergence uh, being too low. Typically, if, you, if problem one is happening, then Q5 of z given x basically ignores x and just outputs a zero mean and a unit variance, which means the z's carry no information about x, which means your decoder p theta doesn't use the z's. And that's why it produces those blurry average images. There's no information in z that would be useful for actually reconstructing x. Problem two is characterized by the opposite, by the KL divergence being too high. It means that there is too much information being packed into z. It is very far from the prior, which means that you can reconstruct x perfectly, but because it's so far from the prior, when you sample z from the prior, your decoder doesn't know what to do with it. And it's very important to understand that these two problems are very different from one another, because if you get one problem or the other in your VAE, the solutions are usually very different. 
So what this means is that you need to control the scale divergence quite carefully to get good results. So how can we do that? Well, a very common trick that's employed to make training of VAEs more effective is to put a multiplier in front of that KL divergence. By convention, we usually use the letter beta to denote this multiplier. It's just a scalar value. It's a hyperparameter that you pick. And you adjust this hyperparameter depending on which problem you're seeing. So if you have problem one, if your z's are being ignored, then you need the KL divergence to be higher, which means that you decrease beta. You make the KL divergence less important so that the VE is free to raise the KL divergence without incurring as much of a penalty. If you're seeing problem two, that means that your KL divergence is too high, and you need to push it down more aggressively, which means that you increase beta, which forces the VE to bring Q5 of Z given uh, Xi closer to P of Z, which will make your samples of higher quality. So that's why it's very important to understand which of these problems you have. Look at your reconstructions. If your reconstructions are bad, lower beta. And then look at your samples. If your reconstructions are great, but your samples are bad, then raise beta. Oftentimes, uh, you can adjust beta manually to get good reconstructions and good samples. But sometimes it is difficult to find a beta that both produces good samples and good reconstructions early on in training. Intuitively, early on in training, the VAE needs to learn to pay attention to Z. And later on in training, it needs to do a better job of compression so that you can sample. So it can often be very useful to actually schedule beta, to alter beta over the course of training. For example, you could begin with very low values of beta so that the VAE learns to use Z, and then later on raise beta to get the samples to be good. So once your reconstructions look good, you can increase beta, and then your samples will become better too. So just keep in mind when you train VAEs that uh, keeping track of beta can be a little bit tricky.